Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 103, Lecture 1. In this lecture, we'll discuss the mass spring system. This topic is covered in Chapter 15 of our textbook by Surway and Jouet. Our goal in this chapter is to understand the behavior of oscillating systems. The model that we will adopt is the mass spring system. It turns out if you can understand the behavior of a mass spring system precisely, then you can understand the behavior of many other oscillating systems. For example, the oscillations of electrons in an AC electric circuit, or the oscillations of a guitar string, or the oscillations of a piezoelectric crystal inside a digital watch, or even the oscillations of a tall building in an earthquake, all can be modeled using essentially the same mathematical techniques that one uses to understand the mass spring system. So over the next few lectures, we'll spend a lot of time talking about the mass spring system, but understand that the same concepts and mathematical machinery can be applied to many other examples. Specifically, we'll be talking about a horizontal spring fixed at one end and attached to an object of mass m on the other end. The object, the block, for example, in this picture, is free to move horizontally. For now, the surface will be frictionless, although we'll bring in resistive forces a little bit later uh, in our lectures. The question is, uh, what is the precise behavior of this mass attached to the spring when it is displaced from the equilibrium? We like to be able to answer questions like, what is the position of the block after 10 seconds of oscillation, let's say? Or what is the velocity of the block or the acceleration of the block as a function of time? To answer these questions, we have to review some concepts that hopefully you remember from your classical mechanics course. To begin with, we want to discuss the force that a spring exerts on the block. If you recall, the force of a spring on an attached mass is given by Hooke's law. According to Hooke's law, the spring force is equal to minus kx i hat. K is the spring constant. It tells us something about how strong or stiff the spring is. The larger the K value is, the harder it is to compress the spring. X is the displacement of the object relative to its equilibrium length. More precisely, X is the difference between the length of the spring when it is stretched and the natural length of the spring. The natural length of the spring is the length that is neither stretched nor compressed. Note that x can be positive or it can be negative depending on whether the spring is stretched or compressed. So if we grab this block and move it to the right, then x in this case would be a positive number. If we compress the spring by moving the block to the left, then x would be a negative number i hat is a unit vector that points in the x direction. For now, we're talking about a horizontal spring, so it makes sense that the force would be along the x axis. Later on, when we talk about springs that are hanging from the ceiling in the vertical direction, the i hat would be replaced by j hat. Another concept that we need to review is that of spring potential energy. Recall from classical mechanics that when a force is applied to an object and the object is displaced or moved by some distance, we say that the force has performed work on the object. Roughly speaking, you can calculate work by multiplying force and distance together. An object's capacity to perform work is referred to as potential energy. Here we're talking about the uh, force of a spring or the work that is performed by the spring. This particular type of potential energy is referred to as spring potential energy or elastic potential energy. Back in your classical mechanics course, you probably calculated the amount of work that a spring is capable of doing on an object, and you probably found that it is equal to 1 half kx squared. For us in this course, the derivation of this result isn't that important. What is important is that a spring that is displaced by some distance x relative to its natural length is capable of performing a certain amount of work. It is capable of storing a certain amount of energy. And that energy, the spring potential energy, is equal to 1 half kx squared. So k is the spring constant 
x is the amount by which the spring is compressed or stretched because it's x squared it doesn't really matter if x is positive or negative and we use the letter u to denote potential energy The concept of energy is going to be very important to us in this class, so let's do a practice problem just to make sure you're comfortable with that idea. A block of mass one kilogram is connected to a horizontal spring with spring constant two newtons per meter on a frictionless table. The block is pulled five meters from equilibrium and then released. Plot the elastic potential energy, mechanical energy, and kinetic energy of the block as functions of position. So what I expect here is essentially three graphs. The first one should be a graph of U versus X, so potential energy versus position. The second one should be mechanical energy, so E versus X. And the third one should be a graph of kinetic energy versus position, so K versus X. Let's review some of the concepts that are going to be necessary for us. To begin with, we have already an expression for potential energy. We know that spring potential energy is one half kx squared. K is given to us uh, as two, so this should be a relatively easy thing to graph for us. Once we plug in two for k, we find that u is simply equal to x squared. So this should be an easy graph that you can make. You should recognize this as a parabola. And you can also plug in some numbers. For example, you know that the, um, the block is initially moved by a distance of five meters. So you can plug that number in and find out, for example, the initial potential energy of the system. The next graph that we're going to want to make is mechanical energy. Recall from uh, your classical mechanics course that mechanical energy is defined as kinetic energy plus potential energy. So in some sense, it's the total energy of the system. Although to be technically precise, it does not include thermal energy, does not include nuclear energy. Uh, it really only includes the mechanical energy of the system. So the types of energy that we discussed in classical mechanics. In this particular system or in this particular problem, the table is frictionless so you should be thinking that the mechanical energy is conserved. The potential energy can go up and down, the kinetic energy can go up and down, but the sum should be a constant. That's essentially a statement of the conservation of energy principle. So what we're saying is that the mechanical energy of the system should be a constant, and that should be a relatively easy graph to make as well. A graph of a constant function is simply a horizontal line. The next thing that we need to consider is the kinetic energy of the system. You might recall from your classical mechanics course that kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Although this formula is correct, it's not very useful to us because what we want is kinetic energy as a function of x and not kinetic energy as a function of velocity. So you're being asked for a k versus x graph not a k versus v graph. So this equation is correct, but it's not very useful to us. Instead, what we'll notice is that mechanical energy is k plus u. Solving this equation for k, we find that the kinetic energy must be mechanical energy minus u. Now we know that u is x squared, so this is basically going to be equal to mechanical energy, which is some constant minus x squared. And hopefully this is a graph that you know how to make as well. So it's going to be parabolic because it's x squared. It's going to be an inverted parabola because there is a minus in front of it. And there is a constant that essentially is being added to minus x squared. And that's going to shift the graph up and down. A little more precisely, this is what the graphs will look like. Here is a graph of potential energy versus x. You can see that I've plugged in some numbers. When x is equal to 5, the potential energy is going to be 25. When uh, x is equal to 2, the potential energy is going to be 4. So by simply plotting a few points, you can clearly see that this graph is going to have a parabolic shape. When x is positive, we say that basically the spring is being stretched assuming we're using a standard xy coordinate system. 
When the x is negative, we can say that the spring is being compressed. What about the mechanical energy of the system? Well, we were just talking about how the mechanical energy is conserved because this is a frictionless table. A little bit later in our discussions, we will introduce friction into this problem. But for now, we can assume that the energy is conserved, so it's going to be a constant. And that constant is equal to 25. You might be wondering how we knew that. Well, if you look at the potential energy graph, you can see that the potential energy changes, but its maximum value at the two extremes is equal to 25. So when the block is displaced to its maximum value, we have lots of potential energy and no kinetic energy. Then as the block approaches equilibrium, its potential energy drops and its kinetic energy increases, but the sum must remain the same. So we can say that the mechanical energy remains at 25. The kinetic energy graph is going to be 25 minus x squared, and that graph will look like this. Again, you can plug in a few values for yourself to see how this graph looks like, or you can just say, well, 25 minus x squared must be a parabola. It must be an inverted parabola because there's a minus in front of the x squared, and by adding 25 to it, we're basically shifting the parabola up by 25 units. As I stated at the beginning of today's lecture, our goal is to understand precisely the behavior of a mass spring system. And by that, what I mean is that we want to know the position, velocity, and acceleration of the mass at any given time. So our goal will be to figure out the position of the block as a function of time. If we can figure out x as a function of time, then we can take its derivative and find velocity as a function of time. And then we can take another derivative to find acceleration as a function of time. So this will be our goal, to come up with an equation and then solve that equation for x as a function of time so that we can then plug in any time we wish, like 17.5 seconds, and find out exactly what the block is doing at that particular time. Now this is going to be a lengthy process, process but at the outset you should recognize that whatever x is, it should depend on some important parameters of the problem. So this function that we're looking for should depend on the mass of the block. Obviously, it matters if the object is extremely massive. In that case, it's going to be moving very slowly. On the other hand, if the object is very light, its acceleration is going to be much greater, and so it's going to be moving much more quickly. The spring constant also is important. A stiff spring will exert a much higher force on the block, achieving higher accelerations. So we expect to see k somewhere in our formulas or our equations for position as a function of time. Lastly, we expect that this function that we hope to solve for depends on the initial conditions of the problem. By that, I mean, what was the mass spring system doing initially at the beginning of the problem? After all, you have to start the oscillations somehow. We normally start the oscillations by grabbing the block and displacing it by a certain amount, let's say 10 centimeters, relative to its equilibrium value. In that case, x initial, or the initial position of the block at t equals zero, would be 10 centimeters. Now, normally we displace the block and we just release it. In that case, v initial, the initial velocity would be zero, but you don't have to just release it. You can also give the block a certain push. You could give it a kick or a sudden force. And if you do that, then you're giving the block some initial velocity as well. So how much you initially displace the block and how much velocity you impart to it at the beginning of the problem is going to affect the subsequent behavior of the mass spring system. So we expect all of these parameters to directly or indirectly show up in our solution to this problem. Now, what's the equation that we need to solve exactly? Uh, where does this solution come from? And to answer that question, we have to combine two very important equations that hopefully you remember from your classical mechanics course. 
Mr. Newton stated that the force on an object is equal to mass times acceleration. This is now known as Newton's second law of motion, which states more precisely the net force, so the sum of all the forces acting on an object, is equal to mass times the acceleration of the object. Notice here I've written acceleration in a somewhat strange fashion. I've written acceleration as the second derivative of position with respect to time. Recall that the first derivative of position, the rate of change in position, is known as velocity. And then a derivative of velocity, or the rate of change in velocity, is acceleration. So this fancy equation that you see here is really f equals ma, but written in a very mathematically precise manner. The second equation that we need is the equation that Robert Hooke gave us. This is known as Hooke's law, and it tells us that the spring force, let's say in the x direction, is equal to minus kx. By combining these two equations, we find this equation at the bottom. I'm assuming that there is no friction, and any other forces are going to be balanced or canceled out. So for example, the force of gravity might be pulling the block down, but that's going to be balanced by the normal force of the table acting on the block. Also here, I'm considering only forces in the x direction, and gravity would be acting in the y direction is in the standard setup for this problem. So what we can say is that basically the only force acting in the x direction is the spring force minus kx. So I can equate minus kx with m uh, times the second derivative of x with respect to t. And what I find is this equation at the bottom here. Our goal is to find the solution to this equation. By solving this equation at the bottom, we get what we want, which is x as a function of time. Solving this equation is going to be somewhat difficult because this is not an algebraic equation. This is a differential equation. So it's a fundamentally calculus equation, not an algebra equation. It's a differential equation because obviously it involves derivatives. In this particular case, it involves the second derivative of a function, x, with respect to an independent variable, t. Our goal in the next lecture is to understand a little more about differential equations and then solve this dif differential equation for the solution that we're after. And that is the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.